and um, I can't figure out if it's quite the same. I don't really think it is. Like they seem to do something where they have like actual like mutable variables or something with observable type stuff going on. Um, and the point of what I'm trying to do is that you don't need any of that, right? Like that you could, um, you know, you're just turning, uh, you know, you're just tr directly translating changes in, in one uh, domain into changes in another. And like you could run it on the server or something, right? And just send in patches. Um, so I don't think it's quite the same, but it sort of achieves the same thing. Yeah, the account one is primarily about optimization. They're but you kind of need the cut operator to like know when to stop propagating changes down the dependency network or something like that, which I'm not sure your formulation is going to give you. So it's probably like a different use case. Yeah, I was mostly interested in, uh, initially I was mostly just interested in like encoding into Lambda calculus, like see if I could do it with like higher order abstract syntax. And that worked out quite nicely. Um, but now, like you know, actually, there's a pretty nice use case for like building UIs, right? So I wanna, I wanna actually like see if I can do something useful with it, like a to-do list or something. What I actually want to get to is like the point where I could define my model, like, like because it has like such a clear sort of uh, interpretation, right? Like I can define my function just as it just looks like a function in the lambda calculus, but I can interpret it in this other setting. I can run it on the server or run it on the client. I should get exactly the same answers. You just like send in patches and just you know incrementally update the DOM inside the like a tiny little JavaScript client, but like write my server in Haskell or JavaScript or something to do all the work. That's what I want to get to. Yeah, so you're more interested in like the the set of changes that comes out at the end instead of like running only that part of the dependency tree which actually needs to be reevaluated. Re like you're fine running the entire network every time. Because that's not the thing that takes time. So, like, the component composition is kind of interesting, right? Because it's not like it's not like where you know, like, consider like thermite or something, right? Where you have this like global state atom, and you you've got to like materialize the entire state, right? It's immutable, and you have persistent data structures, so you're only like updating the bit that you care about. But like, um, you still have this sort of like, giant state thing in, in memory, right? Um, it's not going to be like that big, but you get the point. And then like the incremental thing. You never actually materialize a thing, right? Or you're just talking about these like conceptual changes, so that if it did exist, right? So it might exist somewhere on the server if you want it, but even then, you, you don't need that, right? Like it's just really the state exists inside the DOM or something, and you're just computing changes to the DOM based on like changes to this model that, like, you know, you don't really have a model around, but you can talk about changes to it. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like kind of like event sourcing without keeping the events around. So you're just folding over events that are coming in. To produce the state, uh, basically. Yeah, pretty much. So, um, like, if you have like a to-do list or something, you know, you, you have changes. You would fire an event, and it would get turned into a change, right? So it would say, like, maybe toggle from like complete to not complete or something. And then, as it like bubbles back up to the top, like up to the root, you just sort of like decorate the event, like wrap it up in like little wrappers to like tell you like the path from the root down to the where the change happened, right? So you'd end up with this bigger change that was like at event number three inside the you know completed property change from true to false right that's like your entire change and then maybe like that's nested inside some bigger component it like gets wrapped up more and more right? it finally gets to the root and then you compute the function in like incremental mode and that gives you a so you have a change on your model and it gets turned into a change on the dom and hopefully that gets to changes to something equally simple right? it's just like at element with id x change the css class to display block or something, right? And like you send that down to the client and, and you know apply it and, and you're good to go. Um, so the component composition is like kind of different, right? You don't end up with this thing where you're basically talking about these actual mutations of actual values. It's just these sort of conceptual things that eventually get sent into Tom manipulations. So that's what I'm trying to get to anyway. So I have one way to go with it. So I'll get there. So in, in your uh, demo app that you use for the uh, instance of DOM, uh, you click the button and then that emits the patch? Yeah, <clears throat> pretty much. So it's, it's like the simplest possible example right now. Right? It's just like a single button and you can just turn it from like off to on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what's happening. So you have like, um, it emits like a single change that's like, you know, 
switch this Boolean from true to false or false to true. Um, and it runs through the incremental function and the incremental function turns it into like a style change on the button. Oh, it's the text property, sorry. It changes it into a, a text change on the button. And then the only, ha the only change that happens on the DOM is like a single like in a HTML change um, on the button element. So the interesting stuff is when I like add lists or whatever. But I'm hoping I get a lot of that stuff from, for free from the, um, from like the Lambda calculus encoding, because you can do like church encodings of lists and stuff and get like incremental lists and things like that. So that's the plan anyway. So what people, uh, is this the hacked one or the other one? Oh, this what, is the unscripted one. Which one? Unscripted? Yeah, okay. Unscripted, yeah. uh, we, we didn't have, uh, well, let's see. If, if Ethan was going to come up, come around, we, uh, he, he said he'd present the one at base control thing again. Uh, we didn't, we didn't get, he talked about it a few weeks ago at the uh, hacked one. We didn't get that one. Um, yeah, otherwise there's just uh, you know, some ideas for things to chat about. Well, I mean, I could show the incremental thing, but I only have like half an hour, but I can definitely show that if you're stuck for a topic. Um, yeah, no, hmm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Christoph, did you, did you say that you wanted to show some of the compiler stuff? Yeah, I kind of said I would do it. Like just, <laughs> just list, like just talk about the compiler pipeline kind of and people want to know where. <laughs> Um, uh, like, if people are like, I want to know where this and this thing happens, so that just they have that they have like a roadmap of where in the compiler they're going to find what. Like, there's a bit of a, like the module structure in the compiler, which you can kind of use to tell where where what originates. I uh, filled it one of these a while ago, uh, but obviously since then the compiler has changed like like crazy, and so. Might be nice to have an update on that one. I know it was useful when I looked at that, when I tried to make my first contribution to the compiler. So, figured that might be something. Don't have anything come like prepared there, so might I might like be derailed from time to time. That just happens when you talk about something you enjoy. So, mm -hmm. but I guess that's fine. Almost have find usages working for PSID. A query of how some code becomes a core of N. Yeah, basically. Like a very vague story, basically. The one that lets out all the details. Maybe more like a koans or something like tell you something and then you have to figure out the actual meaning of that. Hmm. Yeah, Tom, great job at Haskell X. I watched the podium one to present. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was, I was just typing questions about the compiler. Um, yeah, a lot of pure script talk, actually, and, and not all inflicted by me, which was nice. It was, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it was really cool. It was a really nice event. And um, it came up in, well, three talks I was in without me bringing it up. So, and I got a V on stage next to, um, well, Nicholas Wu and Gabriel Gonzalez and Simon Thompson. So I absolutely did not deserve to be there. <laughs> but, I'm great. I'll send that <laughs> Yes, yeah, of course, Greg. Uh, it was, um, yeah, no, <laughs> I, I had an, an undeserved sense of confidence, um, probably due to beer. And, uh, oh well, I got a nice picture anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was cool. I liked the video. Yeah, it was, um, and I mean, you know, unrelated, but they are so quick with the recordings. As in, you know, that was out the day after. So 
you know, not leaving me too long thinking. Yeah. That I was the uh, Nando's pizza thing. It didn't happen, right? Um, so we ended up uh, at a Mexican place instead, which was pretty cool. I um, I had quesadillas, that was good. Then we went to a pub. Um, Simon wasn't there. Stephen Deal was, so he was very nice. Talked to him a bit. Um, Chris Jenkins was there. He was very friendly. Um, Oleg, but not that Oleg. That's yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oleg Brenners? Yes, that's it. I only remember him by his bio just being not that <laughs> Oleg, but... He was there, he was really, um, Justin was around, who's not conferencing, because I presume he's actually there right now. He's probably with Chonga doing compiler things. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was pretty cool. And then I, I was meant to, meant to catch Simon on Friday for a drink and then and ran off too early, which was a shame. But, you know, at least I got to email him. I had that moment. And um, he gave his um, compiling without continuations talk. And it was, of course, brilliant. And um, yeah, I still need to get my head around the data points thing. Um, and it's, I was kind of watching it and thinking, you know, I really need to sit down and I really need to look at Core FN because I'm, I'm sure there is so much we can just nick from, from those ideas. Yeah, it's just um, that core is like smaller than ours, right? But they have the core and stuff which complicates it a little bit. I was just basically like, 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 like <clears throat> yeah, on calculated records. Um, yeah, we should, uh, we should really take advantage of like the fact that we can like emit core. We should like we came in quite the other day. We need a way to actually like import the core and run the back end. You know, that would really, and we could actually start doing these like optimizations, internal optimizations. It's exciting, it, it, and um, um, Martin is there, um, Coot, and uh, he seemed pretty excited. So I don't know. I don't know whether we're going to see like a a big push of commits to Zephyr now. He's um, he's been inspired. <laughs> Let me. That's basically the the thing I posed just posted is the thing that was done before the joint points. So it kind of makes sense to understand that. Which one's that? Let no escape the way they optimized like let before. Over in the comments. Or maybe it's out there. I don't know. Um, yeah, other than that, um, I don't know, it was just a lot of fun. I um I was I was um finishing pull requests today. That's about the the only interesting pure script related thing I've done. I've, I've pull requested or I've finished what I said I'd do for um, pure script jQuery. So, you know, indirectly contributing to jQuery. I feel bad about that. Nice. Uh, I'm going to try and dive that later. Yeah, I actually think, like, this is kind of unpleasant, but I'm actually thinking of using that as the default backend for pure script, for example, just because, like, it's, um, I mean, I'm going to have this got, like, abstract version of, like, the diffs, but. Um, like actually applying to the values and not having to think that one can to like uh, work out and like doing it with like the HTML just really sucks. I'm probably going to do it with JQuery, let somebody else write the like low level one. <laughs> yeah, I've um, I spoke to you a while ago about, and I, I think I've mentioned it in one of the gatherings before about um doing uh, templating at the type level and then trying to derive generic data structures for doing um, VDOMless updates and stuff. And, uh, you know, hearing you speak about incremental, I should really get to that. I've, um, I've been lazy and just thought I'll do it when point 12 comes out. Incremental is a staple, uh, don't worry about it. So it's like, I've got like a busted demo and that's all I have. So but I have something <laughs> like that actually does something interesting. I don't know it's going to be cool. Um, you mean the string parsing thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, nothing complicated, just um, sort of mustache templates or something. But I think the um, the interesting bit is going to be trying to put those directives in, like um, looping over structures or conditions mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, I mean, they all map quite nicely onto types, right? If you if you need to loop over something, you've got you've got an array under there, and if you need a condition. Mm -hmm. You've got a, a maybe or an either, so it's. I I don't think it's hard. I think I just need to try it. 
Maybe no one's done it before. <laughs> Maybe it is hard. <laughs> yeah, so the only thing is that the dictionary expansion is going to be like crazy, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's not going to be great. Um, you do, that fits in nicely with the core, the functional core optimization thing. You, know, you could always like, optimize that away later, maybe. So that's, that's kind of what I was thinking with some. Um, you know, I've done a couple of couple of dips into the compiler so far, and and, and kind of slowly working out where everything is. Um, but I've really only messed around with the type checker so far. So I, I think it would be fun to to kind of build a motivating example of of why I want these optimizations, and then use that as the the test case and see see how much more efficient I can get it. Yeah, it'd be kind of nice to like. What I'd, what I'd really like is to, like, when we talked about the data, there was this, like, rewrite rules idea with, that, like, you know, a library could ship with its own set of custom optimizations, you know? You just, like, write them in script. So, like, ST has a, a special optimization, but it has to be baked into the compiler. But that's not, like, incompatible with the idea that like, it doesn't have, like, preferred libraries, right? So, really, you know, just that we just ship with the ST library. Because my audio, like, all messed up. I just keep hearing this, like, weird echo. Uh, no, I can, I can hear you. If, if um, you maybe, is, is, is that Tom, could you try muting yourself just for a second and let Phil say something? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that seems better. Yes, All right, uh, whatever. it wasn't so bad. But yeah, the idea is just that, you know, you could ship the optimization with the library instead and then, you know, I could write my own custom ST library for my own prelude or something and ship my own optimization instead. Yeah. I would have like polymorphic optimizations for um, but yeah, that's where I'd like to get to. But need like some PhD students or some master students to, like go do it, so I don't have to. But I um I think I I can't remember when you said it, but you you said at some point in the past about um preferring features as libraries and saying where possible making libraries of things, and I wonder whether that rather than saying you have library specific optimizations make the optimizer somehow modularized so actually i can i can pick from a set the the optimizations i care about for my whole project rather than at a library level yeah i like it i like the idea i have like an interest in keeping pure script small right because like every feature we had is like another one that like has to be maintained and i have an interest in not maintaining so much stuff. And like the, um, you know, people make pull requests and, and it's great, right? And like features come along and, and then people aren't necessarily incentivized to stick around and like make sure they don't like clash with new features or whatever. So like the more we add, like this is like a graphic problem where like, you know, two features, any two features can clash and like have problems, right? So especially in the optimizer, that's like a big deal. Right? It's like optimization is very rarely commute. Um, so I like the idea of having like a very tiny trusted core of the compiler and like pushing as much as possible into libraries. So like optimizers as libraries is very, very appealing to me. Um, yeah, because I don't particularly want to have to write an optimizer. Like the part, honestly, like the part of the compiler that I really like working on and like, you know, the features I'm also like, more likely to add are like type checker features. Um, so I like the idea of like the optimizer and code generator and all these things being like you know, like external functions on the functional core. Plus it's easier to like spec the language out if we do that. Um, yeah. Plugins like Haskell, yeah, so, well, it's not quite like Haskell. I mean, Haskell, has, uh, Haskell you have to like actually, uh, you know, you have to link against the GHC library, right? It's kind of a little bit odd. Um, whereas this would be an external file format that you like have the option of optimizing. but. I mean, the, the way I'm thinking it would work is for like your development mode, you would just, you know, use the vanilla PureScript compiler and it would generate relatively inefficient, you know, possibly relatively inefficient core um, and JavaScript. And then you could like run that in Node and, and test it, whatever. But then um, the, uh, you, you know, for your production build, you would like run your custom set of optimizers, you know, like ideally like Pulp or whatever would be able to like, you know, Pull them out of the project directories, and you can like enable them selectively or something. And 
you know, it goes off and it takes a, a while, but then it produces this nice, you know, single bundle or something. And that's your production bill. Um, <clears throat> obviously, that's, you know, a way off, yeah. Anyway, um, I have to get going, but uh, I'll be around later on Slack. So. Later, Phil. Good to see you all. Good to see you. Take care. There you go. Yeah, I'm curious about because uh, if, 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 if Joel's mentioning the. So, Christoph, are you now doing a compiler tool? <laughs> uh, sure. I'm not sure we call the talk, but I'm going to try. Uh, it'd be really nice if it wasn't my room and put draw on the board. I'm not sure if you can see it anyway. Okay, so I'll just try. No, I'll go into my room and post it. So I'm interested in what happens if the ST is built and desugared. Well, then you're quite far down the road. But um, <laughs> um, how about I'll be back in like two minutes. I'll just switch machines so that I have something I can draw on. Oh, um, until then, does anyone have anything they want to talk about? Because I, I kind of remember half agreeing to talk about impredicativity and then, um, <laughs> I didn't write that talk, but I can wing it if that's, um, if that's something useful. Yeah. I'd say that winging it qualifies for unscripted. Cool. Oh yeah, for sure. Unscripted. Right. That's the, that's the point. Okay. Uh, let me so um in predicativity uh this is a thing i've been kind of down the rabbit hole about recently um musicians drink after the performance oh thanks well some of you do some of us drank before um in predicativity is a thing i've been down the rabbit hole about for the last couple of weeks actually um not getting to spend as much time on it as i'd like because <laughs> the real world's really hectic um, and the basic principle is that I can have a, uh, a function like, um, uh, let's make it more general. Let's say test takes um, any A to an A, right? And that is, that is some uh, very general formulation of that. And I can take a... Uh, test two and I can say it's the same as x and I can say actually this one's specialized to int to int. So it's it's um it's Christoph's assumption stuff, right? It's it's saying that int to int is um is specific enough that or sorry let's say it the other way around right a to a is general enough to contain int to int and therefore this is okay. Um, and if I do something like that, we get a big uh, compiler error because it's not general enough, right? We've we've now a to a is is almost as general as we can get, except we've said that both sides have got to be the same. So now that's not going to work. That's going to shout at us. And of course, we could you know change that to b or whatever and fix the resulting error, and and it'd be fine. But you know we'll use that as the um, as the example. So um, something weird happens when you uh, let's um, let's use ID. Oh, it's already here, isn't it? So so let's say we've got this. Um, oh, better change that back. So our test, if we're being as general as possible, is. Um, Given some category K, um, it is the identity of some type I, right? You you pick any type and you'll get back the same type. And actually, it's a stronger assertion. It's a, it's the exact same value. Is it stronger? No, parametricity. But that's the point, right? You you it's a whatever you put in comes out again. Um, 
and what's weird, and I hope this breaks because otherwise this is gonna ruin the whole point of this, um, is that I now have this thing, which I've called toast. Um, and what I wanna do is similarly to the way I did before, I want to specialize that. Um, and what happens is I get this fantastic error, which says, um, couldn't match constraint type uh, given a category T1, uh, that category for any type T2 with int to int. Um, as some of you may know, uh, the function arrow is an instance of the category. So what it's saying is I can't match a function from anything to that same anything with the actual type, which is int to int. So intuitively that feels wrong because they should work, right? You, you've looking at that signature, there's nothing actually wrong with it. Um, and so this turns up in a couple of other places, which we can definitely talk about. Um, we can, can we just, can you just show that you can repair this one with a, a if you give it a type signature? Um, oh, oh, is in up here? Yeah. Uh, if you. No, 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 no. Uh, sorry. I mean, if you, uh, put parens around our test down there. And then add the type signature here. Try that one. Uh, well, around the foo as well. Oh, yeah. Right, because that's the type of foo, actually. Wait, mm, are you sure? Let's just see if that works. Okay, never mind then. <laughs> I think you can save it if you, maybe, maybe if you, if you put the type of art or whatever. So there's, okay. there's, there's a, a problem there. There's a, there's a way to get around it, um, which I found really counterintuitive and hopefully now I know why this is. Um, and that's if you, if you take this bit and you put it there, uh, the error goes away magically. Um, it's 22 hours. Sorry. It does that. So every, uh, actually let's do another example and then I'll come back to why this is. So they can be my record tests. Um, and then I want to do, um, function tests. So, uh, what we're going to need here is some higher rank function. So something other than a rank one function. So, um, uh, we could do something like uh, this function takes a function that does identity and returns you an int. The type, oh yes. Uh, F test. Actually, let's just make it a bit more interesting. So x equals x. So this function looks fine. Um, and what we want to say is I want uh, to partially apply to this. And I, uh, I hope this is going to work. Something like that. Um, and so what I get back is a function that really should be this bit. Um, let's do it the other way around. If I do that, I think I get in trouble. Ah, hold on. Let me add another instance. Let's go back to category. Um, okay, I, I, F test equals X. So what we want here is um, int to int. Oh, okay. Wasn't expecting this to work. So the point of, um, maybe if I put in another one. Probably need to put another int at the end because that function is actually not higher rank. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to be clever. Um, uh, ooh, X. Cannot, mm, that's not what I want either. I want. So. Get rid of that. What am I trying to prove? 
could not for all category k i i with int. So mm, let's try this, see if it works. Hooray! Right, there we go. There's a uh, there's a very similar error and exactly what we were expecting. Um, we've got this, again, it's another category that says, given a category from a type to itself, uh, that isn't more general than int to int, uh, which again, we, we know it, it definitely is. Um, you know, it's, 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 well, the same situation as before. Um, and as far as I know, um, new type. It's not, it's not necessary. Sorry. I think this is a subsumption problem, actually, because subsumption, like um, for functions at least, it's contravariant in the sense that something is more general than another thing if the argument is less general. And like one function is, uh, how do I type that out? Um, ta -ta 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 -ta. Uh, it's probably easiest if you just type that out for me. Can you just type one function f from a to b and a function like g from yeah from uh, b to d uh, c to d or something? Okay. Yeah. And so the way this works is f is f is subsumes g. So can you type that out? That uh, subsumes is the colon greater, or you can just type it out like that. Yeah. Okay. So f subsumes g if and only if <laughs> um, b subsumes d and c subsumes a. So it's kind of the other way around, but if you fill that in with something like show a and int, it's going to make more sense to you. So maybe make the b and the d the same, actually, for now. Make them both strings or something. And then make the g like show of a or something. Right. So <clears throat> don't, don't worry about the implementation. It doesn't matter. It's all about the types. like. Uh, G in here. All right, so even though show A is more general, you would not be show A is more general than int here. You would not expect to be able to use uh, that function instead of the show function. Uh, so. How do I take, how do I say that? Maybe we could use these functions in an expression and then just try to replacing them one by like, if you, if you get back, like uncomment the function that's called show here and call it f again, because we're gonna need it. And just give it like some implementation, doesn't matter. Right, and then just copy it coming out the first one. These ones, yes. And now just make a function which uses f. Uh, no, it's, it's a, just a string, h, yeah, just a string, and then just apply to. Right, that works. But you can't put g in there. Does that make sense? Wait, what? Uh, now I'm fooling myself. Uh, da, 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 da. That works because two is still showable. Did I maybe say that the wrong way around? I don't know. Oh, it's always confusing. I'm sure someone can, can do this. Can I take a stab at explaining it? Yes, please. Um, 
So what I would say is G has a type of show A, um, right? So we have that constraint available. And in particular with that for all, we know nothing other than that constraint, um, which is where like you're using, if it's impredicative or something, then you're assuring that all you know is that there's a show instance available for the type, which means you can call show on it basically. Um, whereas with F, you have an int, so you know that the argument is going to be an integer, so you can do anything you want with that int, right? Um, so if you like created some higher order function that took something that um, gave it a show constraint. Um, then um, you would know that you could only pass. Um, yeah, something like that. Um, you should be able to pass both F and no. Yeah. Uh, you should be able to show instance. Yeah, sorry, my internet isn't the best, but you should only be able to pass G in there, I think because all you're saying is I'm giving you something with the type if that has a here in the show instance, that's all. Um, so I think that's one case in which you can G, but not F. Uh, um, but F and not G. Um, you should always. Um, well, now you. And so that still works. But if you type that S into string, I don't know. Uh, for F. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. There was an article I saw recently about um, basically using functors for lots of programming and using this kind of polymorphism and higher rank you could ensure that you only have access to like one layer of functors even if it's like inside new or nested functors so anyways that's just how one way I would think of it so but Right now, we've got loads of examples of the compiler being really effective at its job. Can anyone, <laughs> can anyone break it? Or is it just, have we just shown that actually Christoph's pretty good?
It's it's frozen. Oh my, it's confusing. I have to look at my thesis now to find an example for this. I broke Chrome. Oh no. <laughs> it didn't like that one. That was absurd, apparently. So we try again. Oh no, no, that really is dead. If we need a cheap example, we just write a let binding and it doesn't generalize, so everything breaks. Oh, of course. Damn it, untyped lambda calculus. Okay. Um, oh, man, now I lost my example. I was doing impredicativity. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, subsumption aside, um, I found it really difficult to find something that actually uh, summarized this problem um, for programming. So the, the idea of subsumption in, uh, in the mathematical sense is if we go back to that type signature of, um, uh, well, let's just say equals bar uh, ID. And foo has type of bar for all ki category k implies kii. So in a in a purely mathematical setting, the notion of impredicativity says that um, we we have a type within foo that is general enough to contain foo itself. Right, that that i there is is so unconstrained that it could in fact be foo, um, which isn't necessarily a problem. Uh, it's just something that well, GHC for one, and the pure script compiler as well, uh, don't tend to play nicely with. Um, and from what I can tell, it's an implementation detail as much as anything else. The, the fact is the reason you get in trouble with um, higher ranked functions and records is because when you take the thing out, you have to assign it to a, a type variable, you know, some type variable within the compiler. Um, and the problem is simply that those type variables can't store these uh, existential quantifiers. There's, there's nothing in a type variable that can tell you that it's a for all something or that it's constrained by this category instance or whatever else. So it's simply a case that the information that actually lands in there isn't enough to describe fully the thing you want. So when you come to compare it, what you actually get is KII. So you, you kind of, that category notion is, is, is somehow lost in translation. Um, I don't know why the errors work though. I mean, maybe someone can shed some light on that. You've, you've got this type variable that's missing some crucial detail. So when you do the type checking, it says uh, this type variable is asking for something and it doesn't match this, this value that you've given me. Um, so why do the errors work? Why? Because presumably the error is based off the thing that doesn't have the constraints anymore. I would have thought, I mean, it can't do because it works, right? But uh, that's the thing I need to dive into the compiler and work I, out. I think in the examples we were showing earlier when it said could not match constraint type, the problem is that you have that constraint and you don't necessarily know how to plug something in for it. Um, so you want your function category, of course. Um, so cannot match constraint type category T1, um, with T1, T2, T2. Um, what you need, so that constraint in pure script, um, is represented as a, um, argument, of course, to like a quote unquote function. Um, and there's lots of magic to make it not look like a function. But um, 
it's not so much that you have question marks there, it's that you need to plug in something so you don't have those question marks. <laughs> I don't know. I see where you're going. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Um, so if you unsafe coerce that and try and call it, it should fail. Um, because you still have that constraint type and the peer script, the JavaScript code is expecting a function there. Um, but you're not respecting that. Um, so, um, So there you go. If I did that, we'd get an output. And if I do this under the hood, Baz is a is a three argument function. When it when it goes to compile JS, you've got the the category dictionary that you care about. Then you've got the sorry, it's a two argument function. You've got the category instance that you care about. So that that dictionary, you've got the integer and then the outputs the integer. Um, if I unsafe coerce it, although it looks like it should make sense in, in pure script, um, what that means is now at a lower level, at a, at a JavaScript level, the compiler is now looking at that as a one argument function. It doesn't know that it has to, has to put another thing in. I suspect you can probably get around this by uh, unsafe coercing it to uh, no. <laughs> but then you don't have the information you need from the instance, which is in particular what um, I to I is for all I, which is identity. Yeah, you wouldn't, I so, guess, if you wouldn't know what you're looking, or you wouldn't know how to call it, because to make the call in Baz, you need to look in the category dictionary to find ID. Yeah. Um, we might be wandering away from impredicativity, but if you want to look at your group chat, Tom, I sent a link there. Or I could screen share, I guess. Oh, no, no, I, I, I know where you're going. I think, um, I think I probably have got some horrible link. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's, it's, I mean, it's what you get for unsafe coerce, right? It's, it's, it's what the unsafe bit means. Um, well, so if you look at um, reify symbol, um, uh, <laughs> I once played around with this. Um, so there's a course there. Um, you can't just put a um, is symbol sim1. You have to put the for all and the constraint inside of the first argument there, or it won't infer correctly because of the distinction between how um, how constraints should work at the type level versus how they're represented in functions. Um, so if you didn't put the constraint inside the for all, um, then it would try and solve it, which doesn't work um, because you want to provide that. I have an example now for the subtyping rule, if you want it. Yeah, so let's look at that. The screen. Okay, so I'll show this. Uh, does this work? Yes. Right. Can we see this? Yep. Okay, so I've got f here, which takes a function from into, well, the signature is it takes a function from into into a string whatever that may be. And then I have G here. Let me, let me move K to the top actually. Yeah. Then I have K here where I say, like I keep the int to int argument, but I make the last argument like more general than string basically, like the result type more general than string. And I can totally put K in here and that's fine, right? Because whatever I get back from K is more general than the thing I said I'd return. So I can just return that and that's fine. But what if I, happens if I put G in here? That doesn't work out. 
right? Because G, even though this is more general than this, expects something more general. Like, so it expects more, right? So that's why that doesn't work in that direction. And now I can't put G in place of F. Right, so that's how the directions are like reversed. And if this was, let's say this was for all A to A, uh, sorry, and uh, wait, I need to end this up properly so that it actually ends up there, right? And this was int to int, that would be fine, right? Even though this thing is more constrained than here, then it's like, this is more general up here, and this is less general, you can still do this because yeah, of course, if I have a function for all A's, I can just pass that to G and it's gonna work for ints just fine. <laughs> it's, if we look it up here, I don't know, if you look it up here, it's a bit, where is it? It's gonna find it. Okay, so there it is, like, if you have a function S1 to S2, then uh, T1 needs to be subsumed, wait, T, T, S, S1 needs to subsume T1, and then T2 needs to subsume S, S2, right? So you've got like this kind of, it, like, turns it around for function arguments and function return types, the sub, like the subtyping rule, basically. But if you go back to your, yes. Yeah. Um, Okay. So think about it. Like now with this signature, the argument f gets here is a function that works for all a, a to a, and g expects a function from int to int. So I can just pass x in there, and it's going to specialize it here to int to int. Okay, gotcha. It. Oh, it's positive and negative position. Um, yes, <laughs> basically. My brain hurts. Cool. <laughs> right. So that works out. It's a bit of a different thing, actually, but I just figured while we're talking about it. Oh, what's that? Okay, so I hope that wasn't too confusing. No, no. Now implement G, you can't implement G. I was just looking for types that are more general than others and don't blow the screen, kind of. Okay, so should I do the compile thing now? Are we still doing that? Please. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know how many people we have here. Uh, how much do people in here know about compilers? Who know? Is, is there someone, and don't be ashamed, who does not know what Alexa is? Or a tokenizer? I call all that. I just call it the parser. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the difference between... Okay, yeah, but that's fine. I just learned two weeks ago. Okay, nice. So you, you've learned that one. All right. Hello. Okay. 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 So I'm going to like, the first thing I'm going to do is just like show the different, just draw like the different stages the compiler goes through kind of, uh, just to, so that we have an overview, right? I'm going to make a couple of boxes because boxes are always nice. If I could use my tools, that would be nice. Okay, so let's see how many boxes we need. I'm gonna shift them around eventually. Okay, so this is Alexa. This is the parser. And then we get into the sugaring. Oh. And then we get into type checking. And that didn't work out at all. Why did it change the color? Oh, no way. Oh, what the heck happened? I'm not good with these tools. Can anyone notice it? Okay, and type checking. Okay. So just looking at the chat. Okay, so. Okay, so I'm gonna do these first and then we'll talk about the others. Uh, like there's a bit more afterwards, but I'm gonna explain these steps first before we just uh, run off. So, 
the steps were taken here, the lexer. Okay, so the input here are all the source files. Right? And they get into the piler, compiler, and then we run the lexer across it, which is uh, basically a function which um, just gets, we just put that in front of the parser so that we can, like the parser does not need to deal with each individual characters, but instead with a list of tokens, uh, where tokens are a bit more higher level. And that's inside the language pure script. So this is the, the module structure, basically. And if we open the Lexa file in here, and Haskell tooling wouldn't be as slow. OK, here we go. So this is the tokens. So if you look at this, I'm going to zoom this down a little, just a little there. Just so I can get it on the one screen. OK, so this is good enough. OK, so this is all the tokens that we recognize. And you can see that these directly correspond to like small entities in a text file, each of them. Right? So we've got left parentheses, right parentheses. Um, and then uh, this one is a bit misleading. There's an indent constructor in here. And OK, so there's questions. And I'm going to use your arc mode now, use Nixos, and then tell her, OK. Does anyone have a sub? <laughs> okay, so I should maybe if you have a question, actually, um, is there a way you can tag me? Maybe you can tag me in Slack just so that I get a notification. Because um, yeah, I'd like to respond to questions right away, if possible. Um, okay, so there's an indent constructor. We're not actually using it during parsing, though. So the indentation is not handled in the Lexa. That's one of the differences between PureScript and GHC, where the Lexa actually handles that part. Um, and then we have things like, yeah, here we have a, an L name, which is a lowercase name, right? Which is like a con set of consecutive characters. Um, and so we don't have to deal with that wherever we want to like parse a lowercase string, basically, now that we've already tokenized that. And the compiler can, can work on the um, more high level representation. OK, so that's Alexa. Uh, it's not very complicated. It's important that it's fast. And I have ideas of how to make it a little faster. But yeah, in general, it's not very complicated. You need it for syntax highlighting things or something like that. So that's why that part is interesting as well. And then there's a parser, of course, which turns uh, the tokens emitted by the Alexa into full abstract syntax trees for the modules. And all of the parsing happens in uh, like the primary part module for parsing you want to look at is the declarations one. Uh, so it's parser declarations over here, which has all the like good stuff, and there's a parse module in here somewhere. Ah, no, I can't compute it, sorry. Um, so yeah, so this is the one which takes basically all every token that is emitted by lexing an entire file and parses it into a module. <laughs> So, so Alex asked a question. The Lexa makes a list token, not an AST. That's right. Uh, so if we look at it um, from the Lexa point of view again, we just look at the Lexa here, um, and we look at parse tokens. Here you go. So that's the top level function, which is a Lexa, and it returns a list of position tokens. Right. There we go. OK, so that's what that emits, and that goes into the parser. And then there's like the module parser, and then there's all kinds of like smaller parsers, which uh, there's a parse Boolean literal, which works by parsing a Boolean literal. Oh, yeah, there we go. So that's one, like a simple one, for example. So we're saying there's a reserve name true, and that returns true, which is like an actual Haskell Boolean. And there's a reserve name false. And this, this sign here says we can we try this one first. And then we'll try this one. And if both of these fail, the whole thing is going to fail. And otherwise, we're going to use the first one that succeeds, basically. All right, so that's like, and all work like that, and a little more complicated at some point. But um, so that's how we parse into an AST, which is short for abstract syntax tree. And then what we do is we pass these ASTs into the sugar ring. OK. And then. Uh, we look at the sugaring, it's actually under the sugar namespace, which is a little confusing at times. Um, but if you want to know anything about the sugaring, 
the best thing you can do is look at the language pure script sugar module, which is this one. And then there's just a single definition in here. Uh, it has a big documentation string, which helps, right? And then this is what that looks like. And what the desugaring step does is it takes certain constructs in the abstract syntax tree and turns them into a combination of other simpler constructs. And we use this to reduce the set of like syntactic constructs that we afterwards have to type check and code generate, right? So we make the type checker simpler by doing all these like syntactic transformations over here. And um, we can maybe look at a simple example again. Looking at the chat, just to be sure. I love the shameless mix of, <laughs> uh, yes. So some of these are, okay, so all of this code is monadic. And we can look at the constraints to see what's going on here, right? And so there's a monad error here, which is for all the, which of multiple errors. And there's a monad writer here of multiple errors. The monad writer is for all the warnings that get written, right? And there's a writer here because these just get accumulated and accumulated. There's a monad error here, so this might fail. And in that case, we can't run the, like the, the other digital greens because we're actually returning an error. And so this just returns like a single error if you hit a fatal one. And then there's a moment of supply here because during some of these desugarings, we need to introduce new names and we want to make sure they don't clash. So this is like just a supply of fresh names that don't clash with anything else in the program, basically. Okay, so that's all the context we get in here. So the type checking happens after desugaring. So the type errors in sugar code will reference and show the desugared form. Um, the type error, so, um, it, at first, excellent question, uh, yes and no. So, GHC does, it, uh, uh, does these things this way around because it's nice for error messages, right? Because if you're type checking the source language, you have everything the user just typed basically, you have right there and you can give the user like accurate error messages. Um, so what we, what we do, what we try to do, what we probably don't do uh, as good a job as we can is to preserve source positions during these desugarings, right? So that like the expanded and more complete, like expanded but simpler expressions that we get out after the desugaring still have source positions that point at the original source. And the PureScript compiler itself doesn't actually show you the source in the address. That's what PSA does, right? And it uses these source positions to grab the source from your files. Right? And one of the PRs I'm working on with Gary is to make this a little better, um, this process, because this is a lossy like process, uh, which causes some of these, there are some errors which don't have actual position information on them, or the one where the whole do block lights up if you have a type error. That's one of the problems where Somewhere in this, <clears throat> in this, uh, the sugar do module, somewhere in here, source positions get lost that we should keep. <clears throat> right. And um, <clears throat> yes, that's how that works. Okay, so I'm going to show you um, just to like make clear what that means. Um, I'm going to show you the data type actually. That's, this is the one that we use to, um, which holds all the declarations that we see in source files. And you can see that this has a lot of constructors and I can't put this on one page unless I shrink this down. Um, we can see that there's a bunch of declarations in here and there's a lot more expressions. So this is the expression data type. And there's a lot more here, right? all of these, and after desugaring, and the type checker runs on this as well, but it doesn't really remove constructors. Afterwards, at some point, we end up with core fn. So if I, I'm gonna show you the expression type for core fn. This is all the, all the constructors the expression type for core fn has. So this is basically the job of desugaring, is to take this hugely complicated thing on the left and turn it into this nice and simple thing on the right. Right, and so, for example, 
one of the more complicated issue rings actually is to decode all of the operators that we have, right? All the binary operators into the names that were, they were actually defined with in the source file somewhere and make it into like a set, like a function call, which had, takes two arguments, right? And just figuring out all the precedences of the operators, right? And getting the bracketing right and stuff. And if you ever look for where that's done, that's for example, that's the rebracket desugaring. Right, so if you're, if you're ever wondering about one of these source constructs, um, there's probably something that uh, talks about that source construct in this list. Right. Um, yes. Okay, so desugaring is done. We're down to a simpler, uh, to a simpler AST. Um, and now we do type checking on that. And again, I'm gonna show you the this thing, and that's when we get into, oh, okay, so we have a linter here, which are linting passes. I think these run after the desugarings, or they're like interleaved with the desugarings. Um, these two things like XOR, yeah. Okay, so these lint the imports and the exhaustiveness of case expressions and stuff, <clears throat> and that happens before type checking, because that's still like a syntactic thing. Okay, and now we get into type checking which is below this type checker namespace. And um, I'm not sure how far I should go into this. Um, there are a few things to this. Uh, coming at it from a theoretic point of view, PureScript has a bidirectional type checker um, because we do uh, we have two modes of operations for the type checker. We have a unification stage, which is inside, uni inside the unified file. So somewhere in here, there's a unified function. I think unified type function, yes. Um, so if you look at the signature, what it does is it takes two types and it makes them equal. It tries to make them equal. That's what unification is about. And it doesn't actually return you anything. That's because if it fails, it's going to throw you an error, and otherwise it's going to set like substitutions and stuff inside this state. So unification is a very stateful business. Type checking is a very stateful business, which is a little unfortunate. And then the other mode of execution, one that's um, a bit more complicated actually, is the subsumption mode over here, which is the takes the subsumes function, and what you can see that is that it Again, exactly like unification, it takes two types, but it does not just return a unit, it returns a function from expression to expression. And why this is, I can tell you how exactly this works, you have to ask Lion. Basically, this returns not only a unit, but the sub sub uh, subsumption also includes solving type class constraints. And so what this function, this expression to expression does is it inserts the dictionaries for the right type classes into the source code for you, right? And it basically is, this is the part, I'm not sure, for those who were at Haskell X, um, uh, Cosmicus uh, talked about how some people like to use a type system to check that they don't make any errors, and some people like to like it to do code gen for them. Um, and this function is the code gen that he was talking about. Because with type classes, the comp we can make the compiler write code for us. The road to list feature is probably the best example of that in PureScript where we write, have it write all kinds of decoders and stuff because we just give it a, like a type and it works out all the implementation for us. Right, so that's, that's what that stands for. Um, again, I'm not really an expert on this part, basically. That's where Lion comes in. Um, so check out the chat. The chat. Let's say some us. Well, the reason was did someone say wrote a list? Okay, so Justin just jumps out, jumped onto the call. No, he didn't. Just check. Uh, so Tom, this is the point at which directionary inlining elimination would have to happen. Uh, probably not. You'd want this to first generate the whole hog. The basically you want to finish type checking. And then this is going to have the code, like this is going to return the AST with all the inserted dictionaries and stuff. 
Um, and then what you do, like, because this thing still operates on the, let me make sure I'm not lying to you. Yes, this still operates on the non-core FN AST, right? Type checking still works on the AST that we use for passing. And after we're done with type checking, we um, go ahead and turn that into core FN, right? Um, and if you look in core FN, yes, the important distinction here is that there is no typed constructor in here. The core FN does not have any types anymore, but we need these types to make sure we get the right dictionaries out, right? Um, but the optimization to delete empty dictionaries or inline empty dictionaries, which wrote to list generate, for example, um, because these dictionaries are basically just the compiler needs to insert them so that it behaves uniformly, but there's no real information in, in that dictionary. Um, you'd find these here because these would be applications of an empty dictionary to an expression or something which has no actual like information in it, so you can just remove that call and, and you have to make sure you do that for all the call sets as well, basically. All right, so that's the place where you probably do that. The function expert to expert, okay. Um, so <laughs> what this does, the expert to expert, we apply that to the actual AST, right? Because what subsumption does, it checks if two type, one type subsumes another, and if these types involve type like dictionaries, what it does is it figures out at what type the type classes need to be instantiated, and if you know the type at which a type class needs to be instantiated, you know how to get at the dictionary. And I'm Thomas gone because his laptop that battery died. Um, should probably wait for him. because He seems like it's kind of interesting to him. I don't know. Do others think? Yeah, sure. I, I've, got, I've got a question about the core fun. Um, so that gets, uh, like there's an option in the compiler. You're, you're pretty like, uh, you know, uh, silent. Can you, uh, wait, maybe it's me. No, it could be me. I just, okay. Gabe Johnson. Okay, so I'm just gonna answer uh, Gabe's question really quickly. Okay, so. The subsumes function operates inside this monad state check state. And if we go to definition on that, and of course that doesn't work because this is Haskell tooling. Uh, where is that defined? Down here. Um, oh, probably time for me to head off. Okay, so so I'm Tom's gone. Uh, uh, Okay, so um, there's an environment in this check state, right? And if we check that out, you probably already found it during exploration while we were doing things, but this has the type class dictionaries in it. All right, so the type checker is this huge <laughs> complicated thing which has uh, access to a lot of state. So that's why it's complicated, basically. Um, yeah. But it gets these from, from within the environment, which is inside the check state. Okay, so that was the type checker. And after that, I'm not entirely sure at which point we actually generate the core event modules. And tends to be used to compile to some language because core event doesn't have types, it can't be used to compile to a type language like Haskell. Um, Well, I mean, you can always embed an untapped language into Haskell. That's not a problem. Class and the environment, good to know. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Um, 
the you can't really use it to compile to assembly basically at that point because uh, you don't know how large the data types are. But in Haskell, you can just put it into uh, GHC core does have types. Uh, that's one of the, okay. So he's not here. Maybe you can have continue that discussion with him. Um, okay. So we talked about the type checker. Basically after the type checker is done, we go into core FN and that's where at some point, the optimizations will occur. They don't right now because, uh, can I do this? Make it like a little, I don't even know. Well, okay, so afterwards we do optimization, which we don't right now because uh, that's like the thing that we want attempt to tackle after 1.0 is out. So we have a couple of optimizations. Um, there are very few, uh, but if you're interested in those, I think they are inside, yes, inside core imp, which uh, I think is what we generate after core fn. Right, so in here, inside the optimizer, what we do is we do things like we inline calls to the int add function and the number add function. And we just make that the JavaScript add function, for example. Um, yeah, and that's the ease basically. But there's uh, not a whole lot in there yet, but we're gonna do more of that at, once we're at 1.0 probably. Okay, so. Code gen, yes, okay, so after we've done optimizing, we go into code gen. So that's the last one that we're missing. Um, that box I'm gonna put here. And that is code gen. Okay, so again, I'm not an expert on code generation because I have not touched that code other than basically change type errors I've produced in there. Um, but it's not, it's, Pretty straightforward as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned. So this is a function that does the thing basically. Okay, so this takes a module of and, which is the core fn. Yes, which is a core fn module. And I'm totally sure. Oh yeah. Wait, what's the AST here? Core imp. Okay, so. Oh, that's a foreign. Okay, so that is JavaScript stuff. Okay, so the maybe AST over here is, yeah, okay. So the AST in this module are JavaScript modules because this is code generation, right? So this takes a module and maybe a foreign function identifier, like foreign FFI file. I have to be careful as to which optimizations go where to not assume too much about the backend. That's right, and I think all of our, like all the optimizations we do right now is, are basically specific to the JavaScript backend, which is why they all happen on the core imp part. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Right, but there is a lot of potential for optimization inside core FN, but it's gonna change the, it's gonna change the code that we output a lot. And so it's not predictable anymore what kind of code you get from the JavaScript, uh, from the PL script you write, like the JavaScript and the PL script don't really correspond to another, like one-to-one -one anymore, which is um, one of the qualities that actually kind of got PL script where it is right now. And so um, we kind of don't want to give that up in the main line. Right? We'd rather have the optimizing one be a different compiler so that we can, so that people who still care about that property can continue using the compiler because of that. Okay, and so what this does, like the only thing really complicated about this process down here is that there is uh, somewhere in here is the stuff that writes the, um, the source maps, which is kind of interleaved with the code generation because you need to know where the JavaScript's gonna end up to actually write the source maps. Um, that's somewhere in here. I don't know where, to be honest, um, at this point. 
again, coaching is not really hard. It's basically just pretty boilerplate for what it's worth. Um, yeah, and I think that's that. Um, I was I figured it might be good to give you um, a look at how we actually put all of this together because there's like this one function which does that, uh, which is the rebuild. So this is the function you should start with if you want to understand how the thing like works operationally. So I just talked about like the, the overview, but if you want to see like if the thing throws an exception and you figure out at which part of the code it threw an exception, then you can start from here to figure out the way the code took to get to that exception, basically. Not that it ever happens because we're using Haskell. Um, okay. So, um, interesting, the linting was happened first. Okay, so what we do is the first, okay, so the, let's look at the signature first. So let's ignore make actions. Um, we have, we take as an input a list of extras files. This is related to incremental compiles. So extras files are, um, the compiler generates these after it's finished type checking a module. Um, and what an extras file is, is all the information that you need to compile another module against the module you just compiled, but you don't need to recompile that module instead you like have all the information that's like visible from the outside in that extras file. And this speeds up compilation a lot because just parsing a bit of JSON is a lot faster than compiling a PSCO module. Um, <clears throat> okay, and a module. Does the module actually want to rebuild? And it, as the output here, again, we return an extras file so that we can save it to disk for the next time we need to compile this thing. Or someone needs to depend on this and needs to know all the information inside this module. So the first thing we do is that we create an environment from all the excellence files. And that environment is a thing we're going to use for type check at some point. It also contains uh, like a list of all the names and declarations that are available so that we can do the renaming steps and figure out if all the imports are correct and stuff. And then what we do is uh, we, okay, so this, because this takes a module, we've already finished parsing, right? So the first thing we do is we run disordering. Then we do the type checking. Then we do a special call to the sugar case guards and it happens after type and exhaustiveness checking because of this comment, which I didn't really understand. It's fine. Then we do this, create binding groups. That's a bit of a, um, this is to figure out um, mutual recursive things so that we can like reorder the JavaScript in a way which makes sure that these things def get defined in order, I think. Again, I'm not really sure, so maybe I should just look this up. So create binding groups. Okay, so that's the definition for that. Replace all sets of mutual recursive declarations in the module with binding groups. Okay, so that's what that does. Uh, whatever that means in the end. So yeah, so this is about mutual recursive definitions which don't work in JavaScript, but they work in PureScript. And so we kind of need to do some desugaring in order to cogen that in a way that it works. Okay, so at that point we have everything we need to build a module. Then we turn that into core FN. Okay. Then we do a rename in modules again over the core FM. This makes sure that we don't get any problems with JavaScript, I feel, I think. Um, this is a renaming pass that presents shadowing of local identifiers. Oh yeah, we don't do, oh yeah, because we want to, even if you shadow like X somewhere, like if you have an X as an argument and X as a web binding, we still want to give you an error that points at X. Um, we do the renaming of shadowed variables after all of this happened. And uh, yeah, so we do that here. That's just a thing that the JavaScript doesn't accidentally overwrite variables. Then we do module to file. Yeah, so here we generate the files file. 
right? So this happens before we do code gen, um, but it doesn't really matter because we return afterwards. And then we run the code generation over the resulting thing there. And so that's kind of the pipeline that we go through. It looks a bit messy in here. This thing I think is a little unfortunate, um, but yeah, so that's how it is. Um, so from here, you can kind of go into um, into the different stages and see wherever the thing is that you're interested in. Yeah, and then all the stuff in make, I figured maybe this is like the actual instruction. This is the thing that you kind of call when you call the compiler. Um, this sets up all the stuff that is like necessary to make the stuff parallel. So you are going to find a bunch of forks and uh, threat variables in here. So this is the part that makes sure that the stuff is parallelized. So if you want to look into some of the performance characteristics, this is where you, uh, so performance because of parallelism, this is where you want to look. Yes, so I think, um, good. I think that's all I have for like, high level overview of how the compiler works. And again, I mean, if anyone has any questions about all any of this stuff, I'm on the Slack, like basically all the time. Um, uh, Crystal is asking, what is forking in Haskell? So forking spawns threads. Um, let's see, it shows you from where this is implemented. Okay, so it does not tell where it's implemented from. So let's look for con control concurrent, here we go. Fork. There's not C dot fork. Yeah. Anyway, it spawns a thread basically. Um, but in Haskell, threads are green threads. If that tells you anything. If not, then just ignore it. It spawns a thread. It's like the primitive that creates concurrency. Sure. You want to welcome. And okay, so maybe I should just say what this algorithm does because it's kind of simple. Okay, so what this does is it spawns a thread for every single module you have in your compilation unit. And then what it does, it, it blocks every thread until all its dependencies are finished. There's this bit. And the barriers are basically your dependencies. And if all of those are finished, then you can go and start compiling. Okay. Bye, Gabe. Great. So yeah, come on Slack, ask questions. Um, otherwise you can reach me on Twitter, which is also like at Chris Creek, it's the same thing over there. And you can just also ask me questions over there. And sometimes I might have to refer to you to other people, but I usually definitely know who is the person that could potentially answer your question if I can't. Yeah, thanks a lot. <sighs> Am I? Anybody else have something to discuss, talk about? Is my microphone still super quiet? I'll fix that next time. Yeah, I might be a little loud, but still, I think you're a little silent because the slack notification noise that I got turned out to be quite loud after I turned up my volume to hear you properly. If you're interested, I could go into my little project. Oh, yes. Uh, 
Is that your um, connection qualities? Oh, yeah, I don't have a great connection. Hopefully this will work. Yeah, let's try. Um, suppose I should share my screen. Um, it's a big green button in the middle bottom of the Zoom window. Yep. OK. Hmm. Can I get my chat window open here? Yeah, I had it open, but I think we could just use Slack. Well, maybe not. I think Crystal is not in Slack. Um, okay, I'll keep my phone open, being me. Um, so this is, um, so instead of all the lexing and parsing, um, there's sort of a newish movement that's really old and dying away by now, but <laughs> um, to edit the abstract syntax tree. Um, so you, what that does is you know that what you enter is going to be parsable, so you won't have any parsers. Um, and then you um, don't have to write a lexer or a parser. Um, so I've been putting a bunch of work into this and I haven't spent any time cleaning it up yet. But this is what I've been doing. So my end goal is to be able to write like definitions of ADTs. So you'll be able to write like a tuple type or a, um, either um, do stuff like that and then derive zippers for that. Uh, or Well, zippers, sure. Um, derive lenses for that, prisms. Um, so basically lots of code gen. Um, sort of as a replacement for generics. Um, so I've been working on um, putting everything together. So I have a data type that lets me model um, the syntax of a uh, syntax of um, types in PureScript. So this is pretty basic. Um, before I begin, this um, this dot right here is just a function applic or type application. Um, I just use a dot for readability. Um, so this is, so I have a zipper representing the abstract syntax tree. So what that gives me is a focus. So right here I'm focused on the little red underscore there, um, which is a hole that I have yet to fill in. Um, and here's just my focus here that'll become more interesting. Um, so I have rudimentary type checking, which obviously nothing can be done right now since there's nothing filled in. But um, I can, I, <laughs> I parsed all of the externs file in my current project. So I have literally every type available to me. Um, so this is maybe transformer. Um, I'm not too familiar with it, but it has this kind here. So take, takes like a functor or really a monad, goes from some type to some other type. And then you can give it another type parameter and eventually you end up with a type. Um, types are the only kind that can be used at the value level. Otherwise, everything is like phantom arguments, stuff like that. So maybe we can like put unit here. Um, so now we need to fill in the monad and just go with our favorite F monad, which is rapidly disappearing. And then, so like, I mean, currently my interface allows you to put unit in there. Um, but 
an error occurred while inferring the kind of the whole expression, then while inferring the kind of the sort of that part. And then, so, wants to infer the kind of unit applied to the effect monad, monad. Um, but of course the kind does not match. We need something of kind row of effects, um, but we gave it something of kind type. Um, so, um, so I just have like a empty effect row down here for the heck of it. Now everything kind checks. And I have a couple like ways of traversing the tree, but um, if I go left, corresponds to going up. So this hole here is of kind type to type because it's a monad. So we give it some type parameter and we end up with something else. And if we go right, we get to the whole thing, which is kind type and then unit is of kind type. Um, And then the um, maybe transformer, once we've applied it to a monad, gives us another monad, of course. So you can see there. And then go left again. We get that. So we go up with everything. We can um, make this the result of some function and just like edit the AST. So, um, oh, um, Christoph. So this is your autocomplete component, right? Um, it looks like you were trying to get it to cancel the key presses, but for some reason it still captures them. Um, so if I move around in here, um, so I have all my things here, but if you look up top, up here, the selection I'm changing, um, it's not oh. to change when I scroll through the list, right? <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yeah, you uh, need to, we need to prevent default, like uh, sorry, we need to stop propagation of these events if you don't want them to, to reach yeah. out if you basically. Um, yeah, minor detail, but otherwise <laughs> it saved me a lot of work defining that myself, so thanks. You're very welcome. I'm, yeah, again, I'm going to pull that out somewhere where, it, where it's easier to pull in uh, with Bower. Yeah. Um, so I can just replace that all with like prim.function, um, which has this kind. So we need to give it two arguments before it ends up as a type. Of course, um, my overall goal would be to make it so once I give this two parameters there, um, then I need to go up. Go up. Um, give another parameter. Theoretically, if I give this two parameters, it could expand out to a. Um, it could expand out to an operator, um, because prim dot function is just the arrow we're using over there, really. Um, but I haven't done that yet. So, I mean, I really like the idea of editing AST, but it's a far um, different experience from what we have now, um, where we edit text, because all your operations um, end up looking really funny. Um, 
you can click on things, which is really nice. And the computer will know exactly where you're talking about, but moving around becomes a little funny. So I have really weird um, sort of semantics for what left and right mean. I made them so they're um, always inverses of each other, which means it sort of goes up the abstract syntax tree. So, um, so if I start at the far left, I can go right one, and I end up pointing at the function or the whole thing really. Then if I go right again, I go to the leftmost thing inside the function, and then um, goes like that. But then up operation is pretty self-explanatory. You just go up the abstracts index tree. But for down, I had to decide what to do with that. And I ended up, so from a function arrow, if we go down, we're going to go over to the right argument. And then for some application, we're going to go into the left argument. So I end up there after going down. So up and down is not like, it's not identity because it actually, you don't store where you're coming from basically when you're traversing upwards. Uh, correct. So if you go down and then up, you end up back where you were. But if you go up and then down, then you might end up somewhere different. Lovely. And there's lots of other ways to move around. Like you can say, choose the left child always of the abstract index tree. And I don't have the key for that yet. Um, I ended up with like six different directions you can move, <laughs> which is a little much. <laughs> Um, but once you get here, you have to redefine how you're interacting with everything. And then you have to make people change to adapt to that. <laughs> one, thing that would, one thing that would be very interesting is if you allowed them to, um, like draw boxes with a mouse and then just pick the thing that like intersects, like the tightest thing that still has the entire mouse drag in it or something. Okay. Yeah, um, selection is definitely um, something I need to think about. But it um, depends on how you define that because basically my goal is you're always going to be copying around complete and, and um, like parts of the uh, syntax tree that makes sense. So something that wouldn't make sense is like copying from the first primit to the this primit here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I meant. Complete child of that. Um, yeah, the idea that I had was like you, if, if you select from, pre, from the first into the second one, right? Uh, you'd end up picking the entire expression because that's the first thing that makes sense that fully like surrounds the selection you tried to make. Not sure if that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It seems like a lot of work for right now, but um, I have lots of ideas for how the user interface should eventually look, um, but not enough time, of course. Um, sort of my next cool idea is um, if I nuke this prim.int, replace it with a hole, um, I get lots of kind errors. Uh, what I really like is for it to be able to infer the kind it's looking for there. Um, I think I sort of have what I need. Um, but not completely. Um, so once it infers the kind of a hole, you'll go down here and you won't get silly um, suggestions like dom.html.index.focusevents um, because that could never fit in that hole. Uh, basically everything becomes a hole with a kind. B 
because the computer is so aware of how everything fits together that you're editing. Um, that's a goal. Or so this uh, thing you're editing here. Yeah. This uh, would be your entire program would appear in this yes your presentation. Um. Or would you pick like a, a certain function to focus on in, in your project and then edit that program, that function? Well, I really like the idea that everything would be in the correct syntax data type. So I haven't ventured into the value level yet. That's rather more complex. Um, But once you do that, well, okay, so what is a function? A function is a top level definition. Um, it'd be nice if you could just search for those on the computer would know exactly where you're talking about, what type that has. So you wouldn't need any compiler to go and parse something um, and type check it and tell you what type it has. It would be right there available for the computer while you're editing it. Um, and then think about what the next user interface part of that would be well so if i have some function over here i could have a checkbox over here that says hey do i want to export it maybe i don't want to export it um so i think everything should really be um part of just the data type uh that the computer uses um but for now it's just going to be like code gen so you work in this interface, it produces some pure script code. Can you copy that over? Did that answer your question? Um, yeah, kind of. Uh, you said that you'd like this to generate some pure script code. Would that also gener generate the implementation of like whatever this is? It's like, I, I just think everything's a function, but you were saying something like, I know well, kinds are not functions. Thank you, guys, <laughs> not functions. Um, so my, hey, the idea that I have that drove all this work uh, uh, um, let's see oh hey I am using my GitHub uh, URL. No, here it is. So create pure script data type. This is going to be my program that I was working on. Um, so you would have a name for your data type. Um, and this would correspond to just the name you would reference it with. Um, then I just have like your comment would be right there. Um, and then I would have some list of constructors. So I haven't gotten any editing of this yet. But so this is currently a product constructor, so it would correspond to a lens. Um, and then, so you would edit your, all your data up here, and then this would just be a bunch of peer script code that my interface would produce. You copy it over to your peer script file, and it's all there for you. So this data type, um, presumably could support, um, this could support some isomorphism with a tuple. Um, so you would have a first thing and a second thing. Um, then you would have lenses for the first part and the second part. Um, whereas if you had something with two constructors and one field per, per constructor, that would correspond to two different prisms uh, and would be isomorphic to the either data type. Or if you have something more complicated, that's probably a traversal. Um, so then I need some way to edit the types in a way that makes sense to my program that's generating everything, which is what this is. So, 
Oh yeah, I see. This is just a data type definition. It's not like function definition. Yeah. Um, because I can infer kinds right now, but anything more complicated than that is a lot more work. Did you write that in VS Group that logic? Yeah. Um, it's only about a hundred lines. Yeah, it's not huge. Um, but, but I, I don't even have like variables for kinds. There's no support for poly kinds. It's just either I have a kind of something in my externs file or I don't. But what I would really like to be do doing as the next step is so I can search for the effect monad um, and I get it right here. But in order to fit into this particular hole, we would need to apply it to something. Um, we would need to give it a parameter. Um, so I would like the search functionality to be able to determine what can fit in that hole and then how many parameters we need to give it. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's some um, similar thing you'd expect it to do. You'd like have two searches, right? One which searches for things that already have the right kind, right kind for the thing you expect. Mm -hmm. And then you'd also be able to search for things that have kinds that are kind of like um, bigger than the one you care about so that you can apply things to it to make it into the kind you care about and then automatically have the UI insert the appropriate holes for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then you would basically be guaranteed to get a well-kinded expression out of everything you edit that you're able to insert there. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking about this, um, and I realized, well, that's nice, but what if the kind of something changes in there, then I actually need to handle errors and such. Um, which would happen a lot at the value level. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, you need to have error states, basically. Yeah. Um, or you, well, if you have the ST of everything available, if you want to change the type of something, you can also present the like user with the, you first need to change all of these expressions to have the right type before you can commit the change, basically. Yeah, but that gets that, that gets very tedious because sometimes if you want to change one type, you need to change a whole lot of things, <laughs> right? And you're following the type errors is what you're doing basically. Yeah, exactly. And maybe there would be some list off to the side of oh, you have these pending errors that you haven't resolved yet. But um, yeah, <laughs> there, I mean, there's a bunch of prior work about this. Um, you can also look at Unison, and if you, I mean, I'm not sure how many, how many of these yeah. you know. Um, uh, and I've, I've briefly sure. looked at them. Do you know Landu? Um, I've heard of it, yeah. So, uh, so there are a couple of things there, uh, which maybe like give some good inspiration. I'm not saying they're doing the right thing, but maybe you yeah. can steal some good ideas. And then for the AST-based editing, I have a couple of things in Emacs that I could show you. Okay. I don't have them public, but um, yeah, we could definitely look at that some other time because I have like uh, AST based renamings and stuff. Yeah, and I, um, oh shoot, um, I had, um, Ellie? Hmm. Oh, that's the Elm thing. Yeah, I had an old Elm app. Like before I used PureScript, I was even thinking about this idea. Um, um, I sent it to Gabe. I'll have to find it later. Um, but I have like an idea of all the nice UI sugar I can make out of this. <laughs> um, so it would look pretty. But... Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, there's. There's one person on Twitter, which I'm sure you, you'll find very interesting as well. I'm not sure if you know him, at Deech, like D-E-E-C-H. Okay. 
he's super interested in all of this kind of stuff. Like visual programming is his thing. Yeah. So, um, so he also gave a talk about ATS, which is kind of not really related to the stuff happening here, but uh, he's huge into like Pascal IDEs and some of this and the Delphi stuff and small talk IDEs. I'm not sure if you've looked at these. These were also very UI heavy. Okay. With lots of opportunities to click on things, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah just clicking. That is fun. Um, so speaking of clicking, so everything here is linked to the zipper, which it should have when you, um, which references it, basically. Um, but if I go here and I click here, goes over there for some reason. Some for some reason all my stands aren't moving up right or something. Okay. Oh, those are the tricky bits. Yeah. Um sounds like I need to go, so I'll catch you later. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks a lot for sharing that. That's really neat. Yeah. yeah that's cool. Thanks. That's really cool stuff. Um okay. I'm curious to see where that where that goes. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I'm getting pretty tired as well. So. Yeah. yeah thanks a lot I'm, for joining, guys. I'm out of here. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Have a nice yeah. weekend, please. Bye. Later, guys. <laughs>